Peter, you have been uh, one of the key pioneers uh, regarding the story of the relationship between inflammation and cardiovascular disease. How did you come across that concept? What were your initial observations? Well, you know, we've known for a long time that risk factors such as high cholesterol, such as uh, smoking, such as hypertension, drive atherosclerosis and its complications. But really, we lacked a unifying theory of the mechanisms by which these various risk factors feed in on the biology of the artery wall. And inflammation actually furnishes us, in some measure, a unifying theory about how, these, how all of these diverse risk factors can actually change the biology of the artery wall in a way that sows the seeds for development of atherosclerosis and also leads to the complications, most dramatically, of course, the thrombotic complications, such as acute myocardial infarction and other causes of acute coronary syndromes. Now, in your brilliant uh, overview of this whole literature, uh, the state of affairs regarding the relationship between inflammation and cardiovascular disease, you brought in or affluent lifestyle and, and obesity. What have you learned from this literature over the last decade? Well, you know, we have learned that uh, adiposity uh, drives inflammation. Some of your own work uh, with Isabelle Lemieux and work from many other laboratories suggests that obesity is an inflammatory state, particularly visceral obesity. And recently we've learned from a work of Ferranti and many others that there are cells of the innate immune response, notably macrophages, mononuclear phagocytes, that are present in adipose tissue and that are hard at work promoting inflammation. But uh, to me, from my perspective as an inflammation biologist, when you have the team, it always needs a coach. When you have an orchestra, it always needs to have a conductor. And so we hypothesized with one of my fellows, Viviana Rocha, uh, from Brazil a few years ago that there would be adaptive immunity as well at work in the adipose tissue, particularly in visceral adipose tissue, and that the cell par excellence of the adaptive immune response, the T lymphocyte, might be driving some of this inflammation that's brewing in visceral adipose tissue. And indeed, Viviane, and now work from other laboratories, including Christy Ballantyne and Nico Marx and others, suggests that indeed there are T lymphocytes, they are activated, and that they secrete inflammatory mediators, one of which is gamma interferon or immune interferon, which can really control the other leukocytes and the adipocytes in the adipose tissue in a way that can sustain and promote inflammation and even lead to systemic metabolic changes such as dysglycemia. So it's really more than just an innate immune response that's mediated by macrophages in visceral adipose tissue. There seems to be a uh, much larger kind of inflammatory response. Indeed, recent work from my colleague uh, Guo Ping Shi uh, has shown that mast cells, at least in the mouse, may be driving inflammation as well. So we have not only the usual players of innate immunity, such as the macrophage or mast cells, but also of adaptive immunity, the T lymphocyte. And so it's getting to be deliciously complicated, this inflammatory process that links adiposity with cardiometabolic risk. So we have now abdominal adiposity uh, in, we have uh, inflammation, we have cardiovascular disease. There's literature out there uh, that uh, some therapies could reduce inflammation. How you confront the result on the pharmacotherapy targeting inflammation to you know, lifestyle modification as a practicing cardiologist as well? Well, look, lifestyle is and remains the foundation of all cardiovascular prevention. Um, there are very few of us who couldn't uh, lose a kilo or two or increase our physical activity in a way that would lower our cardiovascular risk profile and uh, not only make us feel and look better, but actually prevent future cardiovascular events. But that said, even strict adherence to lifestyle, uh, particularly if we didn't choose our parents wisely and have a genetic burden that uh, predisposes us to atherosclerosis and its complications, it's not enough. So that's why we're very fortunate today to have some effective therapies 
that can lower inflammation. For example, the statin class of drugs not only lower LDL cholesterol and often raise HDL cholesterol, clearly beneficial effects on the lipid profile, but apparently independent of these LDL lowering effects can also decrease inflammation, for example, as monitored by high sensitivity CRP. The clinical studies that have been performed so far can't definitively say that reducing inflammation will reduce cardiovascular events because statins, of course, seem to do both. So going forward, I think that we have to have an open mind about ways in which we might be able to selectively target the kind of inflammation that is at work in our tissues that drives the complications of atherosclerosis. Now, unfortunately, some very effective kinds of anti-inflammatory therapies, such as glucocorticoids, such as the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents, or such as some of the anti-cytokine therapies that are used in arthritis, such as anti-TNF, anti-IL-6, have adverse effects which may actually enhance cardiovascular risk. So I think that we need to seek further therapies which would be either less toxic or more specific in targeting the aspects of inflammation that are particularly at work in atherosclerosis.